Welcome to episode 205 of Clarity Compressed. My name is Paul J. Daly. I'll be your host, and today I interviewed the one and only Jocko. Jocko! We're making our way through the fog of life, and Clarity is understanding where we are on the map. You are here. <laughs> Let the good times roll. This is Clarity Compressed. So I got to interview a lifelong, well, not a lifelong, but like a hero, personal hero of mine over the last 10 years. And I have to say, usually when I do an interview, I don't have to do a lot of prep. Um, I don't get nervous. I just I just love getting into it. Today, I'm just going to say it was a little different. Just because of the, the meaning this person has in my life, Jocko Willink, a retired Navy SEAL, uh, New York Times bestselling author of Extreme Ownership, owner of Echelon Front, and the the clothing company Origin, and the beverage company, the supplement company. Listen, we've been calling it Jocko Tuesday around here because, you know, we recorded it on a Tuesday. It's going to get released on a Tuesday. So Jocko Tuesday is now a thing. But he is someone who has really shaped the way I think and approach situations. He has shaped my mindset and my mentality. He has taken excuses away from me and helped me start to pry out that deep seated thing I have in me that wants to make an excuse, right? To protect my ego and to protect my, my needing to be uh, doing things right or not letting anyone down. Jocko's voice is in my head, guiding me through some things like that. When something doesn't go right, I hear his voice saying, good, good. Now you have the opportunity to be better to learn more, right? That's my best Jocko, by the way. So um, I was able to, to meet him for the first time about a month ago, four to six weeks ago. Thank you, Joe Chura, for putting on the Refuel event, giving me the opportunity to see him in person and meet him. I went up to him and I asked him, I was like, I know you get a lot of requests, um, but I have a real podcast with a real audience. I'd love to have you as a guest. He says, is it about cars? I said, no, no, it's about, it's about humans. And he looks at me and he looks and he sees I have my bag and he goes, you got your gear with you right now? And I was like, I do. I'm ready to roll. And he was like, ah, I can't leave this spot. So I almost got him to do it right then. But um, he was fort he was gracious enough to connect me with uh, you know someone on his team and Danielle on our team connected, and we made it happen. So here's the interview with Jocko. And I will say, he made me work for it. I was a little nervous. I thought I could kind of maybe come at him from a different angle than he's used to in the beginning. And guess what? He wasn't having it. So uh, we had a really fun interview. It's an extended interview. We're going to show you the whole thing. Um, if this is LinkedIn, we'll probably show you a few uh, clips because we can't fit it all in 10 minutes. But I hope you learn a lot and laugh a little with, I'm going to say, my new friend, Jocko Willink. Hey, Jocko, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. I know you're running around doing a lot of stuff right now. Uh, thanks for giving some time to uh, the audience today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. So, um, Look, I saw the trailer for your new book, Final Spin, that released back in November, and all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, I'm on to him now. I was like, you're actually a performance artist <laughs> because I, I listened to the trailer and usually, I'm used to hearing you read other people, but something about you reading the words you wrote yourself in a, a you know, fiction standpoint made me realize like, oh, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of performance in there. Like, but it's an authentic performance. Do you feel like that is a part of like the creative desire is what's driving you when you wrote the novel? Not really. Um, I never really thought of that before. Even when I read stuff, it's just me reading it, how I read it, just how, how it comes out of my mouth, I guess is just the way it sounds. So yeah, I just had, I have a bunch of stories in my head and that was the first one that bubbled to the surface to come out. So why did you decide to write a novel? Like, you know, I mean, you do so much, you're an entrepreneur, um, you, you do the podcast, which is like an amazing deep dive into the psyche of, you know, what's going on and understanding humans. You, you made it, you made a story up, right? You wrote some, some, some fiction. You said it bubbled up. What about it? Like what inside you, you said it needs to get out. What drove that? Uh, like I said, I got a bunch of stories in my head like countless that are always in there kind of battling to come out. And that was the one that was starting to bang on the door the loudest. Uh, I like the characters a lot. And th that's, that's the one that came out. And can you give, give the listeners a, a little, 
a little synopsis of, of what the actual premise is? Well, the premise is there's two brothers and one of the brothers is about maybe 30 years old and he has some kind of a, some kind of a mental disability and he's not really socially aware of what's going on, uh, but he's, but he, he's functional. And I guess he's like an autistic, uh, basically. I never really clarify that in the book. I just kind of present him as he is. And, but he is one of the things that he likes. And a matter of fact, the only thing that he likes is doing laundry. So he works a laundry mat. He clips coupons for various large laundry detergents. He likes to starch clothing and iron it. And that's what he does. And he, like I said, he works in a laundry mat. And his younger brother is um, about 23 years old, street smart, handsome, witty, but he's made some bad decisions in his life. And so his life is not going in a great direction. He works at a big box store as a stock boy. And as the story progresses, the laundromat where the older brother works is going to be sold. And the younger brother realizes that if that laundromat gets sold. The older brother won't be able to work there and the older brother won't be happy. So the younger brother comes up with a plan to buy the laundromat. In order to buy the laundromat, he needs money. And in order to get the money, he decides he's going to rip off the big box store that he works at. Comes up with a plan with his best friend and they execute the plan. Unfortunately, things don't always go as planned. And that's where the story kind of goes sideways. Man, I can't wait to check it out. And you know, I, I did read a little bit about um, the characters and you, I heard you say something like these, a lot of these are, you call them, I believe, composites of different people you have met along the journey and along the way. And this is kind of what you did is put them, put them into these stories. Is that, am I representing that right? Yep, that's correct. Uh, for instance, the, I worked at a Wendy's when I was a kid and the, the person that ran the salad bar back when Wendy's used to have a salad bar. I remember that. Was a, was a woman named Jean. And she was probably 55 years old, maybe getting closer to 60, but she was, had some kind of autism or something. And she just was trying to do a good job. She loved working that salad bar. She loved cleaning up salad dressing. She loved cutting up pineapples for the pineapple jug. <laughs> and every time I talked to her, I was very nice to her. And every time I talked to her, she just wanted to talk to me about the salad bar and and she, I felt like she was actually getting abused by the people that ran the Wendy's because they took such advantage of her. They worked for all kinds of hours, but at the same time, she was happy, mm. happier than I was. She was happier than most of the people that I knew. So that is an example of a character that always stuck with me. I'd like to talk about entrepreneurship, specifically American entrepreneurship. Um, you know, over the last 10 years, you've, you've been really busy and, you know, a lot of people probably know you're an author, um, some people know, I'm sure that you have a, a consultancy for leadership. Uh, probably fewer people know that you actually are the owner of a clothing manufacturer or a partner in a clothing manufacturer called Origin. And you also have a line of supplements and beverages. And so like your entrepreneurial tendencies are like really going full tilt. And I was really curious, what, what drives the entrepreneurial tendency? Was it in your family growing up? Um, is there, you know, obviously we, we build business and as a result, we make money, but what is it that has you leaning so far into this broad entrepreneurship? I, I guess I just want to make things that I use <laughs> and I want to own Fair. things <laughs> that I, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to make something, I'm going to own it. And, and it turns out that some of the stuff that I make other people want as well. So if you make good quality products, other people want it. And I just kind of make things that I like to use. You know, I make jujitsu geese for jujitsu, make rash guards for jujitsu, make jeans because I wear blue jeans. I make boots because I wear boots. I make protein powder because I like protein. I like it to taste good. I don't want it to have sugar in it. I make an energy drink because I wanted to make an energy drink that wasn't poison. And I just yeah. <laughs> make things and, and, and put them out there in the market. Yeah, that's I, I make things that I want to use myself. That's, and I can't ever seem to find things that in the, in the, in the traditional market that I want. So, you know, you, you, you can't go get an energy drink that's pasteurized that didn't exist. So I had to make it, 
Uh, you can't get jeans that are 100 made in America by American hands. You can't get it with all, you know, really. The yeah, the rivets are made in America. The zippers are made in America. The thread is made in America. The cotton is grown in America. Everything's made in America. I didn't know that. And same. Is this all manufactured by Origin too, or do you have American vendors that you make sure it's coming in? Manufactured by Origin. We don't manu We don't weave the the uh, material. Some of the material we do. We don't we don't weave all of it, but all of it is woven in America. And as far as I mean. Gosh, manufacturing is something that forever, you know, we've been told can't happen here. Um, it's just it's just too expensive or people don't want to work. Um, obviously, you figured out a way to crack that code. Yeah, that's just not true. That's just big corporations that wanted to save money and make more money themselves. And they did it at the expense of America and at the expense of the communities and the, and the expense of the American worker. You have you have partners in that business, yep. Origin, and uh, it's located in the Northeast. I think Maine is that correct? Well, we have a we have a bunch of fact we have a couple factories up in Maine, and then we have a factory in North Carolina as well. What's it like? Um, what is the feeling you get like being an employer, someone who's provided that when you walk the floor, when you go visit? You know what what does that build in you, and what do you feel like you can impart into the workers? Oh, I'm I'm thankful. I'm thankful that they're there, that they're that they do what they do, that they work hard, that they have the skills, that they're willing to push through, and things are rough, and there's a lot of work to be done, and they're American workers, and they get up and do it. I'm thankful to live in a country where we have that kind of work ethic. How do you feel about um, the mentality that is is propagated in some instances that? Um, we need to go elsewhere to get our products and we need to like there's this interdependence that we can't ever get away from like what do you think about that i, I hear it all the time i think there, there's an element that it's easy to start to believe that like until you told me you had american made jeans that are fully in america i would just not have believed it do you think it's just big corporations do you think it's lack of uh local entrepreneurs or american entrepreneurs realizing it's possible or putting the energy like what do you think is is that breakdown? I think the narrative was for so long that we can't do this in America. We don't have the skills anymore. And the, the reason for that is because the big corporations would rather pay some slave labor over in China, you know, whatever, a dollar a week, than pay an American 15 bucks an hour. So they want to save that money and they're willing to propagate that story so that that's what people believe. It's not true. It's a lie. Indeed. So I get to work with, um, I think, probably some of the most tenacious and battle-tested entrepreneurs in the country. I, I get to work with car dealers. And, uh, you know, car dealers have a stigma. Um, I, you know, probably 80% of the people I interact with are these entrepreneurs that you never would have heard of. And, you know, millionaires and billionaires that have employed hundreds of thousands of people and, and believe in America. They believe in figuring out a problem. Um, not panicking, but getting it done. Um, what is your experience? I, I always ask this question, whether it's an Uber driver or whether it's, it's Jocko on the podcast, what is your perception of the automotive industry, retail automotive, like going to a dealer and buying a car? I would say I'm pretty disconnected from it. Um, you know, I, I kind of just drive a car, you know, I, ha I have a sprinter van. That's what I drive. So there's really no, you know, it's, I guess it's almost seven years old. I, you don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. I, I like, I mean, like any red blooded American, I like cars and I'm sure, you know, at some point I'll, I'll get more cars that I like, but I, I'm not, I'm not a, a person that obsesses over vehicles very much. What do you, what's your all time I, favorite car? I don't want to, well, my, my all time favorite car, which I, I had was a 1974 Ford Quadravan, which is a four wheel drive van. And yeah, that was, that was my favorite car at one point in my life. I'll get another one. Um, and that's why I have, a, I have a, I have a sprinter cause I have a four wheel drive. They, they started making those in 2016. I got the first year that came out. So what do you put, what do you put in the sprinter surfboard? <laughs> like, why do you, why a sprinter surfboards, camping gear, skis, snowboards, more surfboards, Stuff. guitars. Yeah. Stuff. So thinking of, you know, you probably see car commercials, you know, you probably understand, you know, 
that that's a part of life. Do you have anything you know, like I'm asking this on behalf of the audience, right? Like what is, what is Jocko? What word of advice does he have for a group of entrepreneurs that are in a, a major transition and the, the future definitely looks uncertain, but you know, they know they're going to make it or they're going to try to make it. What would you say to an industry like that? What's the major transition? Uh, major transitions, electric vehicles is a major transition moving from combustion engine to electric trans, um, what we would call barbarians at the gate. So you have companies like Carvana um, who are selling outside the dealership network. You have uh, big players like Tesla coming in and you know a difference in Tesla's sales model is that they can sell direct to consumer. When you buy a Ford or a GM or Toyota, it has to go through a franchise system that is sold by a local dealer. So if you're a local dealer, you're saying like, oh, well, Tesla can go around those rules. How are we going to provide a great experience even though we're kind of a middleman? Yeah, well, I, I would look at the situation and figure out how we're going to either adjust or adapt or what ways we can do better than the, the other, than uh, I guess Tesla in this case. What In what ways can you actually perform better than them? What are the advantages to the system that you have in place? Are there advantages to the system that you have in place? Because you have to be realistic with yourself. If there's things that you're doing that don't make sense or you're not going to be competitive, that's going to be a problem. So you have to have an open mind. You have to be humble. You have to be able to say, oh, you know what? There's some things, the way we've been doing these things, the way they're doing it is better. We need to make some adjustments um, to dig in and let your ego get involved and think, well, you know, we've been doing this forever. This is the way it always is supposed to work. That's not going to be a good move. It's not a good move in combat. It's not a good move on the battlefield. It's not a good move in business. It's not a good move in life. So saying, uh, you know, it's, it's a mistake. I see a lot of times when, when people aren't, when things aren't going the way some, someone wants them to go, they just go harder in the same direction. Right. And, like, well, <laughs> this isn't quite working. So I'll just, I'll just do the same thing more. And that's not, that's not a good plan. You have to actually detach. You have to take a step back. You have to look at what's happening. If the, if the, competitor is doing something is somehow beating you. Now you have to figure out if there's things that you, that are still advantageous to you and, and then say, oh, okay, these are some things that we should capitalize on. But you also have to take an honest look at yourself and your, your tactics, your techniques and your procedures and see if there's some things that you need to adjust. And if you don't adjust, you will die. That's what happens in combat. That's what happens in business. Look at BlackBerry. BlackBerry just shut down the BlackBerry phone for good. They at one point had, I think, 84% market share. All of it. Oh, on yeah. On the smartphone. That's insane. I never could have imagined. I had a BlackBerry. Me too. I could, never could have imagined that anything would have happened that would put them out of business. Well, guess what? They didn't adapt. They didn't look at what Apple was doing and say, oh, what are they doing that's actually better than what we're doing? What adjustments do we need to make? Blockbuster, same thing. Those are two examples of, of companies that didn't adapt to what was happening. So to hang on, to dig in, to, you know, you have me on here and you think, oh yeah, Jocko is a warrior. He's going to say, you dig in, you fight. It's like, no, actually you better maneuver. You better make adjustments or you'll get crushed. Why, why do you think people keep digging in? Like what did you observe so many leaders in motion and so many companies in motion what are the things that make someone just like do try to do what you just said not to do, right? We're going to do the same thing, but more. Yep. Most of it is because of ego, because we don't like when someone else is beating us. We don't want to admit to ourselves and to our team that what they're doing is a superior methodology. We don't want to give them credit for coming up with something. We don't want to change because humans don't like to change. So we, dig in, we hang on. And, and again, that's, that's when, that's when, that's when companies go out of business. No doubt. Um, have you worked with any, anyone in the automotive industry in a leadership capacity? I've worked with a bunch of companies in the, in the, in the automotive <laughs> industry, everyone from dealers to manufacturers and everyone in between. So we've done a ton of work. Yes. So this podcast is called Clarity Compressed. I talk a lot about this principle of clarity and, and basically I define it as perspective. If you go in the mall, you want to go to the Apple store, uh, the map is completely useless until you have perspective of the you are here on the map, right? You could just start walking, but unless you have that, um, why do you think, or give me, I would love to hear your perspective on 
how leaders should approach getting perspective on their situation when there's a lot going on and they're getting a lot of information from a lot of places, what should they do before they start to move? Well, the first thing you need to do is detach, which is take a step back, take a step back from the situation, take a step back from your emotions, take a step back from your ego, take a step back from the from the lessons that you've learned in the past, which may or may not be pushing you in the right direction and just try and do a, a better assessment. So, so that's number one, take a step back. Take Actually, can back. I, hold, can I stop you there? Because when you say sure. just detach, right? Like that's one thing coming from you, but like, I'm, I'm feeling the pressure, right? When you say detach, like, do you have any practical tips on like, when you're feeling that way, you should do, this is how you can start to detach. Yes. You should start off with the physical manifestation of detaching, which is literally take an actual step back from where you are and look around, look at what is happening, <laughs> observe what is going on. And when you take a step back, it changes your perspective. You can, you can then look around that changes your perspective. The other key thing that leaders don't do enough of is they don't listen. They don't listen to what's happening. They don't listen to what people are saying. They don't listen to their subordinates. They don't listen to their peers. They don't listen to their superiors. They don't listen to their consumers. They don't listen. And so when you don't listen, you're not taking on board any new data. When you don't have any new data, that doesn't improve your perspective. The uh, last thing I would say is ask earnest questions. So you can't see everything yourself. So what you have to do is you have to ask earnest questions of the people that work for you, the people you work with, the people you work for, the customers, the clients, you have to ask them earnest questions about, about what they are seeing, about what they, what they perceive. And as you start to ask people and you listen to what the responses are, you not just hear what the words that they say, but truly listen and try and put it in context around what you see. That's going to give you a fuller picture of the situation that you're in so you can respond adequately. So the last 18 months, two years, right? World, world events, life, business, everything has been kind of turned upside down. And we've been faced with a lot of issues that all of us have never faced before um, in one way or another. And now like as business is opening back up, there's just still so much noise and dialogue. Um, and I think, you know, whether or not people sit on one side of the political spectrum or the other, I think everyone kind of has this feeling like, it's my it's my job or it's my duty to stay informed, to try to like communicate my perspective or get people to come over. And so the question I have for you is, how how do you or how would you advise people to kind of shut out social media and politics, all the noise, so they can still enough so they can still execute well, without ignoring their responsibility according to their perspective, right? Without ignoring the responsibility to be a good citizen and be engaged. How, how does, how do those things work together? Um, in the military, I learned that the first report from the battlefield, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's not necessarily right either. <laughs> so <laughs> you can't react off of the first guy that calls you up and yells, hey, we're under attack. We're getting overrun. We're all going to die. You can't, you can't, you have to take that with a grain of salt because what you're hearing is what we just talked about. What you're hearing is one person, one perspective from one angle filled with emotion, filled with ego. And that's what you're hearing. So what you have to do is you have to ask them earnest questions. You have to try and figure out some other, talk to some other people that have some other perspectives and you have to sort of, you have to paint a fuller picture for yourself without allowing yourself to personally become emotional and overreactive to these reports that are coming in. So what happens on the news every single night, every single reporter Every single story wants to create a headline that you click on, that you share, that you spread to other people. That's what they're all. That's literally what they are trying to do. It has nothing to do with them trying to tell you factually what's going on. It has to do with them making statements that will draw you in and then get you to share it and, and 
push that same dialogue to as many people and you kind of like it because if you say something that's exciting or inflammatory, oh, I yeah. can immediately send that out to other people and they'll find it exciting or inflammatory and they'll do the same thing. So how do you overcome that? You, you do what I just talked about. You take a step back, you detach, you don't get emotional about these things. You realize that you're hearing it through somebody else's ego, through someone else's emotion. And I'm not going to waste a bunch of time and energy reacting to stimulus that comes in every 15 seconds via your phone, via your TV. It's just, it's just inundated with it all the time. And so I, I'm not saying that you have to ignore what's happening, but if a story is really important, it's going to have an impact on you. It's going to take a couple of weeks for it to, to manifest itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. most stories, by the time two weeks are, have gone by, they're not a factor anymore. That's they're not so true. They're not a factor anymore. So, and if they are still a factor, then you can start making some iterative decisions. So you can make some small decisions to start to adjust to whatever this, this, situation is that's unfolding. So that's what I do. I don't get caught up in the 24 hour news cycle or the 12 hour news cycle or the one hour news cycle. I don't get caught up in headlines because they're just written to make people emotional mm -hmm. and I'm not buying into it. And, and I have stuff to do. <laughs> I have things to do. Like I, I can't be reacting all day long to ludicrous information being poured down my throat into my ears and into my eyes. It doesn't, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. You can't function properly that way. So thank, I don't do thank it. you for that. Uh, okay. So a couple of quick things. We have a few minutes left. I'd like to do some rapid fire questions to get your first takes. These will be a little bit fun. And then I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to ask me a question. Uh, first, what's the greatest vehicle ever created? Doesn't have to be a, a passenger vehicle. Greatest vehicle ever created. Mm. You know, I, I have to <laughs> give some love out to the Humvee. The Humvee, and it's it 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 had its time, and it it definitely is been surpassed now by a long shot. But the Humvee was a super durable vehicle. It it was capable to the point of almost not being a vehicle. It was almost somewhere in between a tracked vehicle, like a tank and a, and a regular vehicle. And I spent a lot of time in Humvees. I relied on Humvees a lot and they were just, they were just great vehicles for what they needed to do. And for even beyond what they were designed for that we ended up relying on them for a lot. So I guess off the top of my head, I have to give some credit to the, the good old Humvee. It's good. It's good. Okay. Next one. I don't know if this is going to be easy or hard for you, but in your opinion, who's the greatest leader of all time? The greatest leader of all time. Correct. You know, I think that every leader is going to have ups and downs is going to make mistakes and is going to do things that they maybe would do differently if they got the opportunity to do it again. I can tell you that the leader that has had the most influence on me is a guy named Colonel David Hackworth, who was a highly decorated army soldier and became an officer and he wrote wrote a bunch of books i never met him but i, I read his books and read his books and so he had a, a huge Im influence on me and even though i believe he was a great leader he certainly was not a perfect leader and made plenty of mistakes in his life and i think i learned as much from his mistakes as i do from the things that he did well all right this one surfing jujitsu Weight training. You can only pick one for the rest of your life to do. Which one are you going to pick? The thing is with jujitsu, you need to have someone to do it with you. You, can, you, you cannot do jujitsu by yourself. Surfing, you need waves. So the only thing that you can really do regardless of the scenario is working out, is lifting weights. Uh, but luckily I don't have to make this choice because I get to do them all. <laughs> okay. Great. Good answer. Good answer. Um, all right. Who is the best podcast co-host of all time? The best podcast co-host. Jeez. I don't know. I mean, 
<laughs> I'm trying to tee up Echo Charles for a little love on this one. Yeah, I know, I know. It's just, uh, yeah. You uh, don't have to answer if you can't think of one. I was just, I, I was I, just giving him a layup. No, I can't think of anyone that I know of personally that I would consider a good co-host for a podcast. They don't. I think they, uh, they, they just make too many mistakes. They are cruise too much, and I think that. You know, I'm always looking for a replacement. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure Echo sees this. Uh, very, very last thing. Um, you you get to ask me a question and I'll answer quick. Ask you a question? Yeah. Throw you off for a minute. Uh, what kind of car do you drive? I drive a 2020 Kia Telluride because you get a lot of value for your money. I'm not, I'm not a big car guy either. I like people in the car industry is tied to people, which is why I do so much work in it. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like I answered that question earlier about vehicles um, because I, I, I love cars just like any normal American human. Um, I love muscle cars. Uh, I love trucks. So yeah, when you started to ask me about vehicles, three off. Yeah, it's it's um no, it's not that it threw me off, but it just seems like it's a whole category of discussion. It is. So. Well, maybe maybe we'll come back and talk about cars sometime. I have to get you out of here. You have other things to do. Um, thank you so much for spending some time with us here today, and uh, look forward to giving you an ROI on your time here with us. So thank you so much. But right on, man. Good talking to you. Appreciate it. Have a good one. So at the end there, I did I did get him smiling. That was one of my goals. I was like, I want to ask him a question that he's never been asked before. I want to try to keep him engaged because then it's better for everybody. But I want to get him to smile. He Jocko doesn't smile a lot, which is fine. That's what we love about him. He's on a mission. He's on the path. Um, but we did. I did ask him that question there about Echo Charles, the best podcast co-host. And I love how he just read them a little bit. You know, I'm always looking for a replacement. So um, hopefully you learned a little bit uh, today from the show, from Jocko, from watching me get nervous in the beginning of the podcast because, you know, he's a hero of mine. Uh, but guess what? Everybody's just a person. And so that's just what we do on Tuesdays. We interview we interview Jocko because that's just what we do here. So in the meantime, thank you for coming on the journey with me. Thank you for paying attention to this podcast. I hope you learned a little something. I hope you carry it forward and execute. I hope it gave you just a little bit more clarity and perspective. And like Jocko said, right? Detach. Take a step back. When you do that, you can see the whole situation or more of the situation. Have the perspective and the clarity you need to make the right next step. So until next week, I'll see you. We can.